Thank you very much, uh, Shang Jing. And um, I, I probably like to start by saying that uh, the the as has been discussed, the this era of uh, overlapping and compounding uh, crisis presents uh, fundamental choices uh, about how to manage uh, globalization. And uh, we we hear it almost every day: has globalization gone too far? Are global value chains uh, too risky? Is it time to uh, scale back uh, trade integration uh, in the name of economic resilience? Uh, and is multilateral trade cooperation uh, passé? And these are critically important uh, questions that we've heard um, uh, previous speakers uh, refer to them. And I think the answers uh, will, will basically, the answers to them will shape uh, the future of trade and trade cooperation uh, for, for years and decades to come. And this is why it's so important that responses be based on, uh, on facts and not, not fiction and on analysis uh, rather than uh, intuition. And in that spirit, um, I would uh, use my remarks today to, to do two things or to convey two messages. The first one is that the increasingly, increasingly fashionable idea that retreating from global trade is in order is not really supported by, uh, by evidence and that the continued uh, ability to manage globalization through multilateral trade cooperation requires a reshaped uh, WTO. So on, on the first uh, point, uh, you, you, uh, you all recall probably uh, Bob Solo's uh, famous, uh, you know, you can see the computer age everywhere, but in the productivity statistics. And I think it's fair to say that we can see trade decoupling everywhere uh, but in the data, uh, at least as of uh, uh, yet. So preliminary estimations that we have run at the WTO do not show trade between blocks uh, falling compared to trade uh, within blocks. For the US and for the European Union, trade with China this year has grown faster than with other regions, except for a small hiccup on uh, quarter uh, two in the case of US-China trade, and it is at or close to record levels. Instead of uh, global supply chains being scaled back, uh, what we see is production networks adjusting, uh, particularly within Asia, to take advantage of uh, wage differentials or because of uh, uh, efforts by firms uh, to diversify production locations and suppliers. And we can see here in the bottom quarter, for instance, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Lao PDR, um, have seen their participation in uh, global value chains grow in leaps and bounds uh, since uh, 2010. Other indicators point in the same direction. For example, the consulting company uh, Kearney's reshoring index for the US has been negative for two years uh, in a row. And a recent survey of about 3,000 global companies revealed that most have shunned reshoring and nearshoring, preferring instead to ramp up inventories or to diversify suppliers, or in some cases to work with fewer suppliers uh, regardless of uh, location. Now, this does not come as a surprise considering the potentially uh, high cost, the steep technological challenges and the uncertain benefits for companies of reshoring or nearshoring their uh, supply chains. Indeed, Though some reconfiguration of global supply chains may be war warranted, if you wish, to, to restore uh, some kind of balance between efficiency and security, we should be, I think, under no illusion that this would be costless. Uh, this is especially true uh, if the largest trading powers decide uh, to move towards full trade decoupling. So some of our WTO economists have recently run simulations for what would happen if the world uh, economy were to break in two self-contained blocks. And they found that the long run level of real global GDP would fall by about 5% uh, due to less realization and technology spillovers. And that's, as, as you may recall, well above the 3.5% hit inflicted by the uh, great financial crisis of 2008 uh, to long run potential output in OECD countries. And that's not counting uh, the losses from reduced scale economies, transition costs for uh, businesses and workers, disorderly uh, resource allocation, 
you know, not to mention the prospect of new trade barriers uh, within uh, each block. So having looked at the cost, uh, what about the other side of, uh, of the ledger, the purport purported uh, benefits of decoupling and reshoring? Because it is true uh, that trade, of course, makes economies more dependent on far-flung production networks and more exposed to cascading risks and shocks. On the other hand, global value chain integration also allows economies to diversify suppliers, pool resources, uh, share information and expertise, all of which makes um, uh, economies more adaptable, more innovative, and better able to withstand a crisis when they hit. So this paradox was at play uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that trade and travel ties uh, allowed COVID and its associated economic shocks uh, to spread around the world within uh, weeks in early 2020. But soon after the pandemic first uh, struck and after some disruption, trade and supply chains uh, became a vital uh, lifeline for producing and accessing critical medical uh, supplies. And this was visible in the data. In 2020, even as the value of global trade decreased by 7%, trade in medical products increased by 16%. Uh, so the key question is whether uh, the role of trade as a transmitter of shocks outweighs its, uh, its uh, role as a shock absorber. And the weight of the evidence from several studies, including uh, last year's WTO flagship uh, World Trade Report, suggests that it is the role of trade as a shock absorber uh, that dominates, which basically means that greater participation in trade and global value chains uh, far from undermining resilience, can be a sensible countrywide strategy uh, to manage uh, risks. And of course, we must not forget that even purely domestic supply chains are vulnerable to shocks. We just saw it with uh, powdered milk in the US and there are plenty of episodes uh, like this. And I think that the reality is that this will become increasingly clear as uh, the planet keeps heating up and the frequency and severity of localized uh, shocks, uh, such as uh, floods, fires, droughts, and other extreme weather events uh, keeps um, increasing. So in such a world, the countries who uh, can rely on trade to cushion the blow of extreme weather events and other localized uh, sh uh, shocks will be better off than those that uh, cannot. So all this to say that a better balance between supply, uh, security, and efficiency uh, does not seem to lie in decoupling, reshoring, or self-sufficiency, but rather in deeper, uh, more diverse, and less concentrated global uh, markets. And this leads me to the second part of my uh, intervention, the role of multilateral trade cooperation and the WTO in managing globalization. So, at a time of uh, increased trade tensions and the uh, and geostrategic uh, competition, the, the idea that multilateral trade cooperation at the WTO are to be abandoned in favor of regional, geopolitical, or even power-based approaches is becoming increasingly popular. And I think this is, uh, this is a mistake. Uh, turning our, our backs um, on multilateral trade cooperation would leave a void that would be quickly filled by protectionist and populist impulses with everyone worse off. And I would like to suggest that multilateral trade cooperation is really the world's best bet to safeguard and expand growth and development opportunities, to improve resilience, uh, and support and accelerate the digital and low carbon transitions uh, in a way that works for all countries. So let me say a word. Uh, on each of these uh, three areas where multilateral trade cooperation can make a difference. So the first one is uh, safeguarding and expanding trade opportunities for growth and development for all. Um, we know that, and we heard it uh, from a previous uh, speaker, multilateral trade cooperation at the WTO underpinned decades of uh, trade enabled growth and development uh, uh, that have lifted over a billion people uh, out of extreme poverty, though the pandemic may, uh, has reversed uh, some of those uh, gains, while at the same time, rising incomes and uh, uh, middle classes and emerging economies open new opportunities for producers from advanced countries 
and increased trade integration lowered prices for uh, consumers uh, worldwide. Now, it is true uh, that some people were left uh, behind, which partly explains uh, the disenchantment with globalization. And it is equally true that far too many countries, especially the least developed ones, have yet to connect and benefit from trade and global value chains. But multilateral trade cooperation is uniquely capable of delivering more inclusive uh, trade outcomes. And it is also essential, I think, to ensure that all countries can tap into the new trade opportunities uh, resulting from the ongoing transformation that we're seeing um, in the way we do business. And here I'm thinking about digital services trade. Um, and we, we've seen it also from other presenters, the data tells a very clear story global exports of digitally uh, delivered services have more than tripled uh, between 2005 and 2019 uh, with a growth rate of 7.3%. Uh, you know, they have far outpaced uh, uh, the growth of global exports and that of uh, uh, all services exports. The pandemic, of course, has accelerated uh, the shift online and uh, digitally, digitally delivered services exports grew 14% year on year in 2020 and 2021. And e-commerce sales uh, soared with estimates suggesting B2C online retail grew by at least 25% globally in 2020. And then again, by roughly uh, another 15% in uh, 2021. So digital platforms are changing who participates in international trade, bringing in more women-owned uh, businesses and uh, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. We also heard uh, um, about, uh, um, for instance, what uh, Alibaba is doing in this uh, regard. And all this, despite the fact that cost of trading services are almost twice as high as the cost of trading goods, that legal commitments on services trade uh, are in general very weak, and that there are no global rules on digital trade. So these are all areas where multilateral trade cooperation is uniquely suited uh, to bring about uh, change to help countries uh, tap into the, this new opportunity. And you know, there's already action happening here at the WTO. There was an extension uh, in our latest uh, 12 ministerial conference of a ban on custom duties on cross-border electronic transmissions, and also a recent multilateral initiative on services domestic regulation to cut red tape in this area. Now, the second uh, area um, of opportunity where multilateral trade cooperation can make an important difference is a more level playing field uh, in global trade to address the perception uh, by many that competition in the global economy is not fair, that it is distorted by market barriers and government actions. And I think dealing, of course, with subsidies in agricultural, manufacturing, and services is a key part of this. We know that subsidies can, of course, be important uh, public policy tools, but they have become an important source of tensions, uh, trade tensions among countries, eroding trade benefits, and undermining uh, trust uh, in the rules-based trading system. The WTO has rules in this area, but they have been negotiated 25 years ago where global value chains and multinational state-owned enterprises were less prominent than they are today. And the imperative of using uh, public funds uh, to support the net zero and digital transitions were not really on uh, the agenda. So greater information and transparency are the starting point uh, to an engaged discussion in this area that should encompass at a minimum all major players. The third and last area I want to highlight is the contribution of multilateral trade cooperation to help solve the climate crisis. Um, and uh, we know that uh, trade and trade cooperation can be very powerful tools to accelerate the transition to net zero. Uh, for instance, the cost of solar and wind energy has fallen uh, precipitously since 2010 um, by 85% for solar and 56% uh, for onshore uh, wind. And this is, uh, has much to do with uh, trade and the emergence of a globally integrated supply chains in uh, renewable energy. Going forward, of course, much more can be done. Uh, again, WTO estimates that lowering tariffs and non-tariff barriers on a set of energy-related environmental goods 
could boost exports by 5% and reduce global carbon emissions by 0.6% by 2030. Now, just a word, of course, to say that cooperation at the WTO is also essential to avoid potential trade frictions resulting from the rapid, um, rapid proliferation of increasingly ambitious climate measures. Now, to advance this uh, agenda, and I'm about to conclude now, multilateral cooperation must be revitalized and uh, reshaped so it can do in, a, in the 21st century uh, what it did in the second half of the 20th century, which is to underpin trade-led growth, development, and prosperity for all. This will not be easy because we have these powerful geopolitical and geostrategic forces uh, pulling at the scenes of multilateral trade cooperation, and they're probably not going to go away anytime soon. So the system must adapt to this new reality. Now, in our 12th ministerial conference in June, a WTO reform process was launched uh, with the goal of redesigning our dispute settlement system to make it fully functional again. Uh, of reinvigorating our negotiating approaches by making them more flexible and better equipped uh, to deliver uh, fast and effective outcomes, and about re-energizing uh, transparency and policy dialogue so that policymakers around the world can keep up with the complex and evolving challenges. So in conclusion, the world, in my view, needs effective and nimble multilateral trade cooperation to manage globalization in the 21st century. And early reshaping of trade cooperation will help uh, countries uh, move towards a more efficient, resilient, better, and sustainable global economy. Thank you, Shanjin.